delay. Totally. It's, yeah, it's, in, it's in case you swear, we'll, we'll pause the, yeah. the audio. <laughs> what, it's not, it, but it's not live. It's right? live. Oh, it's live. It's live. Right now, we're live. Yeah, we're live. And, um, Wait, can we so, swear? Yeah, I was just joking. Is it gonna be yeah. bleeps? How about we start with the start of the collaboration? Maybe you could talk about how you two began working together. Ben. <laughs> Um, we started, well, it, it kind of goes way back to um, 2000 and something, six. Ten. Could be. Maybe. 2001. 2006. 2006, yeah. The Odyssey. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Ben was touring around Europe uh, with a bunch of films with another filmmaker called Jonathan Schwartz. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, I used to be involved in running a cinema with some friends in Brighton mm -hmm. and we put on their show in Brighton. So that's when we first met. And then um, I guess like gradually we kept <coughs> meeting, meeting each other at film festivals and became friends, started realising that we had ideas mm -hmm. that um, gelled or chimed. Um, and then we decided to go on tour together with, a, with five each of our films. Um, in New Zealand and Australia. Mm. It was a program called We Cannot Exist in This World Alone. Um, and that was, you know, we, we did, I don't know how many screenings, 20, 30, 60? 16, <laughs> I think it was 12. Um, and, you know, through showing our films in relation to each other, you know, obviously there's a, there's a conversation mm. happening between the films and between us and um, that's when we started thinking about the idea of making something together. Um, and when we showed them at the time, I mean still, I always, uh, with my short films I would always just put BR in my initials at the end of it and so for the first few films it wasn't quite evident <laughs> who was making what in the program even though it was, I think, evident in terms of form or content but it took a little while for audiences to sort of sort out who was who and what was what and that was I think an interesting premise from which to begin like how, how to merge two things that maybe um, yeah that, that have commonality in terms of like interests but not but as far as the way the content and form are sort of enunciated wasn't I mean I think we both have really specific uh, artistic identities and so yeah, we were curious to see how they would work together and also just wanted to like hang out more. Yeah. What were some of the shorts that were playing together? This really great film called Dove Coo, or Coop, <laughs> which Ben never shows. Mm. No, it's a lost film. Well, there's just one, one off print. I, I, Is there I only made, one print? Yeah, there's only one print. Yeah. I guess I'm, I'm sort of precious with it. Yeah, you show that over and over again. I did. You don't have a negative, you just... No, it's, a, no, it's yeah, just a one off yeah. done with a torch. Yeah. Um, a print made with a torch. Um, yeah, I don't know. Our Liberty, Workers Leaving the Factory. Um, stuff. Yeah. Trips number six, number three, number four, number four? Maybe. Maybe. Happy. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was a mix of I mean, it was all things that had to do with the sort of the, the global, I mean, the, the fact of living in a world where all of these really different lives are being lived simultaneously mm. so I think um, part of the way that we selected the films was was in thinking what what was happening you know that there's you have Dubai where buildings are sort of skyscrapers are being erected really really quickly and then you on the flip side you have um, the folks in our liberty who are living in you know in the hills and have and like around the piles of rubbish and old cars and you know it's almost like the future of Dubai found in Scotland or, I mean so all of these and the trips number six which is in Suriname having these things uh, in, a, in a small village where people are animist and wearing really contemporary Halloween masks and taking cell phone pictures but also involved in a kind of really sort of tribal ritual that all of these things are happening at the same time and I think that was um, maybe one of the reasons that we sort of arrived at this this topic, which right. I think is, is very much, this film is very much about the present, it's about what's, about the possibilities of these three instances in, in the present. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
And you mean the present specifically in the sense is not the past, not the future, but like yeah, the kind of now, transformative I mean, possibilities right. of now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, all, but also thinking about the future, I guess, yeah. like the move, that move, you know, the, the, the present is always very fleeting, obviously. Mm. Um, so I think, yeah, that, I mean, that was, a good, that was definitely the seed of, of us kind of arriving at this film was like thinking about the present moving into the future, I think. I mean, that's something that I think I'm, I'm always thinking about with, with all of my films. Mm. Um, There's yeah. a strong sense of the past in your films though, especially. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I, I, I'm sort of interested in, in kind of intermingling um, the tense, you know, the, the time, I guess, like the, the future becoming the past and the past, the present and the, and the present, the future. Um, so they get kind of, I'm interested in that, that kind of sense of not knowing exactly where you are mm. in time. It's interesting, uh, does this inform the structure of the film, the three-part structure, which some people are calling a triptych, but it's, I, I feel like that's a, like a linear one, whereas you guys have the symbol of the triangle, which seems more apropos yeah. to me. It's, it, yeah, well, that's exactly why there is the triangle, because the, these, are, these are three things that, um, when you look at an equilateral triangle, they're, they're, you know, it can only exist with these things in equal parts. So there's no hierarchy amongst the sides of a triangle, as in the same as there's no hierarchy amongst these three things. Um, they're things that we, we sort of imagined um, could exist in other orders, or they're, they're happening simultaneously. Um, you know, the, the nature of, of cinema is that you have to put things in an order. Um, so that, that produces some kind of um, narrative, almost accidentally. Um, but we've, we've also talked about this, showing this as, a, as an ins installation piece. With the, with, so you have like the three different parts um, in three different structures. So they're, ha they're happening, they really are happening simultaneously. So then it's, it's the viewer who, who kind of makes the kind of the choice of, uh, you know, what they see first. Mm. Um, yeah. It would be interesting to have a physical space to walk through because it's a film that is kind of about mobility in a way. You have a, a, pr a central protagonist, you could say, that is the guiding, uh, I guess, trajectory through the, the different parts. How did you come to uh, decide upon having a protagonist in a film list such as this or someone that the audience follows specifically? I mean, I think it, um, it kind of needed a, like an anchor, like a, a vehicle to take us through these different things. Otherwise, I think it would, they, they would seem too disparate or it, it would be harder for a viewer to you know, figure out why we put these three things together. But if you put a person in there who is repeated, then, then they become, you know, like the audience, they're the, they're the observer, they're the person sort of passing through these spaces and then you can think about um, like, you know, what that means to try and exist in those three different places and, and that it's, that it's a, a continual in, inquiry on his part. And, and I think that the, I mean, this inquiry that we're, we're pushing forward has everything to do with the position of the individual, which is, I think, a particularly like Western capitalist privilege to think about these things. And that there's, there's one thing, I mean, everything always reverts back to the singular within this, trying to figure out what the, the single human's relationship is to nature or, or to the social group or to the sort of embodied moment. And I mean, that all of these things are happening within the other, within each section, but having an individual around whom uh, the film could locate itself was really important. And I think, like, yeah, underlining this and allowing, also allowing the viewer to identify with, or to have like a, a way into this stuff. Mm. If you're just looking at nature, I mean, a film about nature is not nature. And it's, I think it's quite hard to like get to that sort of regard or the, the sense of your, your relationship as a human to this, this outside world if you're like 
making a film if <laughs> you're presenting it in the inside. I mean, there are certainly other ambitions or other things that a film about nature can produce, but... But so that's so, but yeah, we're, we're not interested yeah. in that. We, no, we're, we're not interested in making a film about nature. Uh, we're, we're, we're only interested in, in like, that yeah. person's relationship yeah. to it and how that re also relates to society mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, this is, this is a film that has a lot to do with, with community. Um, and your relationship to other people. Mm. So even um, his taking off into the wilderness, um, it's still about, it, there's still a direct relationship to community and other mm. people and the, the people who were there who have yeah. left these places and uh, left these traces of a previous community. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that's why you kind of really need this singular body to kind of guide you through. But the first, first shot is interesting because that it is about nature and there is no protagonist, but it, you kind of have this, you're in the, like a boat. Or... I mean, you can see the, I mean, if you look carefully, there's, and well, there's the sound of roar, yeah. ro ro rowing at the beginning. So the, yeah. the oars, I mean, that proposes that, you know, this is a kind of point of view that, that I mean, there's a, there is somebody there. There's also the camera and the audience <laughs> there. Yeah. I, I like the point that it's not nature as well because when I was watching that scene, I, all I could see was the fact that the landscape is being mirrored by, by the water yeah. and it just looked like a sound wave like, for the music that starts to come in. So it was abstracted to the point where I wasn't even really considering yeah. it as nature. But moving to the, the title, uh, what is the role of kind of magic in this in this film, and then maybe even more uh, literally the fact that it's a spell that's warding off something as opposed to a more maybe active, uh, like it's blocking, right? Or just holding it bay. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think there's no. It's always, I mean, you don't. There's no. There's no day without the night. And the night without the day. I mean, it's a really simple idea, right? And so darkness is like an essential part of, of natural existence, but also of like emotional existence. And I think um, within within a, within this particular moment, it seems like darkness is actually kind of has been abstracted. Like it's not. I mean, life is certainly quite difficult for a great number of people, um, but there's also I, I think that the the sense of I mean it's almost it's not quite existentialist, <laughs> but it's the sense of like how how to produce meaning within one's life, um, and how to how to like move forward and how to like function significantly in the world. And I think that's the sort of darkness that I mean that's one of the darknesses that's there is this like the the constant threat of like being being overwhelmed or like receding or. No, we we also thought about it in a very in, in very direct terms about yeah. cinema as right. well. You know that this is um, the, cinema is a spell to ward off the darkness. I mean, it's, which is exactly what it is. You're sitting in a dark room, and you know, you have the light from the projector, and that's um, it's a spell of sorts, and it's a spell that we're really interested in. Um, I mean, when we and when, in, yeah. yeah, I mean when we when we I mean that's what all this is about really is, is making cinema and um, you know we're not interested in uh, you know representing the world we're, we're interested in making a world that exists for that X amount of time um, so that yeah I think that's that's another kind of magic mm. that we really believe in right spell casting is about invocation and the creation of things and I think spells generally don't last forever mm. um, what, that shaman in Estonia said, he asked us what the unspell was, because once you cast a spell, there has to be something to offset it, which I think is the same, like, lightness, darkness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are very much, like, looking towards the sort of alchemical, um, I mean, the really, like, really magical qualities of cinema mm -hmm. as, as both a image capturing medium, I mean what happens with light and silver halide crystals and also what happens with uh, perception of motion, mm -hmm. movement and, and all of these things were sort of, I mean these are all the ingredients of this, this, this thing that, that dislocates us and places us into a, a really different time and a really different space and that's the ambition 
of the film is to yeah, conjure up something else for, as Ben said, this, this period of time. What is the unspelled one? I don't know. The unspelled... We haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> might be the... <laughs> Bad press? <laughs> Bad press is the unspelled. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about it as like the, the, the topic of utopia mm. um, and how utopia for Thomas More literally meant like no place and, yeah. and that the cinema is kind of a no place. Like you, you're, as much as you can be embodied as a spectator, you're not physically going anywhere. And it made me think of what Foucault called a, a heterotopia, which was just an other space. And he, he talked about mirrors, which are very similar because you see something that is like it is there, but it is not. I'm wondering if you could talk maybe about utopia, the, the space of the film versus the spectator, uh, whether there is this embodied experience or if it's something else. Well, I think we, we've always hoped for an embodied experience. I mean, that's something we, we talked about a lot, and not just in the final part, which is much more obviously about being embodied in the moment, and that's really what that part is about, but we also want a sense of embodiment in, in the other sections as well. Um, maybe, maybe it moves, you know, it, it, as the film progresses, I think it moves more into a space of, of um, that sense of embodiment mm. in, in, in the cinema. I think, you know, the, speaking about utopia, we, it came like, a little ways into the film, we hadn't we hadn't really talked about utopia at the beginning when we. Was, I mean, we were talking about we, it. We just didn't use we, that we, term. We didn't use that term. What yeah. was the term you used? I think it was secular spiritualism. Was mm. was or meaning or you know like things that are a bit. Well, like being being in the world in a in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, having a positive relationship with the world. Um, and this term recently, dark optimism, came up, which I think we both really like as a way of thinking about it, that it's, yeah, it's not, it's not this like modernist relationship to the world where you like invested in beauty and, you know, that there's a sort of totality of meanings that you can arrive at, but rather like these things have been fucked up and, and have like settled down a lot, but there's still, there's still like a belief in the possibility of beauty. There's still a belief in like the brightness of human relations and all of these things, but it's, it's qualified by an awareness of jealousy and pain and suffering and all these other things, post-colonial theory I think has a lot to do with, with like changing the way we think about uh, modernism and, or beauty and things like that. So for us it's, it's like looking towards having a, dark, a darkly optimistic perspective on, on the world or the possibilities of the world. So I think that that, and, I mean it's a really different idea than utopia, but it is in a way... Well they were related, I guess, because we were We've been, we've, we talk about utopia as something that's transient, it's something that um, can be arrived at, but that shouldn't be thought of as something that is, is finite, or, you know, that, um, that perhaps the only way to think about it in a, in a realistic sense is something that um, you, can, you can live through, but you have to be thinking about the future and, and like, the change that happens and you know which is why it's there's three things in this film and not one um, because he's he's kind of he's moving he's maybe none of them are right for him or something you know but, um, or maybe they are in the moment um, that when we were living in this uh, small commune um, one of the participants he, uh, he used the phrase, um, utopia is in the present. He only saw it as something that existed in the present, which I think kind of completely chimes with our, our feelings about it and, and how we approach this film. Mm. Yes. And in thinking, I mean, it's in thinking about the, the, the sort of, the ebb and flow of your experience of the film in each of these spaces, I mean, this, for us, it was important to have a kind of discomfort mm. that was con not not being able to just like totally drop into this commune and be like really overwhelmed and in love and whatever, whatever. Or then go into the nature and feel like exquisite and magic, and then go. I mean, I mean, the black metal I think is a really good point because it's it's loud as fuck and it's like really 
I mean, it gets really unsettling, mm-hmm. but there is something, there are these shifts that happen where you're, you're like, I, I, w- I would hope, or at least, I mean, for me, where I become really involved in, in, in this thing and, and, and your thing, and you're sort of overwhelmed in it, and then you, you like pull out of it, and, and then you come back into it. And I think that happens in the other two sections. I think in, in the black metal section, it happens a bit more viscerally, and, and I think in the commune section, it happens a bit more cognitively. Mm. But it's still that idea that, that you know, the utopia, the utopic moment is a present moment, and so while you're like there with it, mm. you, it can happen for you, but it requires a bit of work to be entirely present. And so there's always this like shifting in and out of it. And you're aware of, I guess, and I don't mean this critically, but like an ethnographic kind of tension, right? Like that you're, you're, you're not part of the communion, you're in it in that moment, but it, I mean, you are documenting it sure. in some way. And this is something that exists in both of your works right. up to this point. Is, is that, how, how do you approach that your own being in the space uh, of, of, or documenting someone that you're not necessarily a part of that world, you're just there temporarily. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a minefield. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, I try and do it sensitively. Mm. Um, I mean, we have, diff- we have different ways of working, I guess, yeah. um, when we're on our own. Um, I tend to sp- like spending a lot of time with people and revisiting them and kind of becoming friends with most of the people I film um, and yeah I think definitely for both of us we see the people in our films as as collaborators so we're making films with people rather than about people and I think that's that's quite an important distinction yeah I mean everybody who's who's in this knows what we're doing and everybody is is like involved in the process and that I think is a really really critical component of how we go about making work and how we made this I mean that I I would like to think that we're our presence is is there um, in terms of camera work in terms of proximity in terms of these other things I mean there's that shot of when Polina has in the kitchen shot of Polina with a baby and then the camera moves down to Leo to Leo and the camera's like you know it's, it's, it's very close and I think that there is something about distance that proposes presence mm. you know that if you're if you're there with people then I would I would hope that the audience understands that there is some sort of contract or relationship but I also I, I don't think that either of us believe um, that cinema is actual <laughs> that it, it is the world, that it's rather just like a, another way of, of seeing or experiencing the world. And so to try to propose that, to try to make a cinema that doesn't have power relations embedded in it and doesn't have a kind of, you know, hi- some sort of hierarchy is, is to not make cinema. Mm. Really. And, and in the first section, I mean, Ben, your films tend to deal with groups of people more, more than yours, which tend to be more like the second section. Is that like a kind of deliberate acknowledgement of your work before and how you're, how did, you, how did it work as far as like the actual shooting? Like, were you able to draw upon each other's experience as far as? I mean, I think that's, that's inevitable that uh, our past experiences yeah. would, would be in there, but at the same time, we, the, what, one of the main reasons for collaborating is, is to, is to not impose our ways of working on this, but rather to try and, you know, be pushed to do that, something that you wouldn't normally do. And I, I think, yeah, the, there's you can see echoes of both of our work in this film, but um, it's it's a film that neither of us would have made alone, sure. you know. And that that's the most important thing, I think. And like you said earlier, we don't really think of it as a triptych. It is a triptych because it's in three parts, but it's also, it's a whole. Mm. So, you know, we like to be clear about the fact that when, you know, when we were shooting, we're we're both looking through the camera Mm. um, for for every shot, really. And, you know, the steady cam for the, for the last sequence, which was, um, really great steady cam operator that Ben used before on his feature, let each one go where he may, um, Chris Fawcett, and a really great focus puller called Mac. Mac. Yeah. Um, anyway, the amazing team uh, that move like dancers, but, you know, 
we were the ones who kind of drew their maps and you know made sure that they they kind of um, asked them in a way to work against their tendencies. Yes. As, yeah. as camera operators, focus pullers, to do something quite different. So I mean, everything was was really. Uh, intentional and, and thought out. And I, I mean, I always wonder if actually every time somebody says that group solitary or finds commonalities, and the fact is we've both made like upwards of 25 yeah. films and videos, and I mean, you have a feature that has one guy in it. Yeah. So, ergo, and a few other films that have, but not, yeah, I was gonna uh, not say all of them. I mean, they're like... A world rattled. Uh, I thought a bit about that as well. I mean, it has uh, people, yeah. like All Liberty has a bunch of people in it. Slow Action has uh, does groups, have groups of people. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's that, and then I'm trying to think of ones that have only one person in mind. Trips number seven. Trips number seven. <laughs> yes, that's a single, single woman person. in the landscape. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. So, so I mean, I, just, I feel like there's there there are tendencies that both of us have, but I mean, the point of the point of collaborating isn't to like make the thing that you yeah. would make on your own because if you try to do that with somebody else, it's just going to be bad. Mm -hmm. It's just going to get fucked up, you know, because you can you can do it better on your own. And I think the the interest was was to like take on strengths or like qualities, characteristics that are present in what we're doing and try to like move them forward and shift the way that we're working. And I think. Um, Probably, well, certainly, like the the solitude and the black metal sections, or the phenomenology section, were were more familiar territories. Mm. In that they were more, a lot more controlled on on both ends. That we we sort of set things up and had, you know, I think that the ways that we worked in them. Not actually that black metal was more familiar for me and commune or solitude was more familiar for Ben, but that the ways of working in those spaces was something that we both like were pretty aware of and, and, and I think that the commune section was was more of a challenge and one that we set up for ourselves intentionally to film in a certain way. It was like a two, two camera shoot and we had sync sound, we had conversations, we had these other things and there was something that we talked about also as like a challenge to ourselves to not just do this thing that we knew that we could do but to like push it into other spaces. Um, so yeah, the, the social I don't think that there wasn't any sort of conscious move towards like highlighting mm -hmm. particular tendencies. Mm -hmm. The solitude section is the one with the kind of almost taxonomy of like uh, like the overhead shots of um, terrain and also magazines, correct? Yeah. What, what was the thinking behind that element of the solitude uh, section? Like it's overhead, it seems. Yeah. Maybe not. I don't know. No, sometimes. I mean, yeah, sometimes not, they are. Or there's they, a lot of. Yeah. I mean, you're talking, you're talking about the, the magazines and the... Yeah, no, and the, like, I feel like there's a grass calendar. or... Yeah. But, but the... Uh, yeah, I mean, the mushrooms... Some the mushrooms are kind of head on, actually. Yeah, ants. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... But uh, it was more about the, the relationship between the close-up and the, yeah. the long shot. And I think that's something that we were actively trying to do, was to not, not have a lot of, like, middle shots. Okay. But to have have things where, because we were thinking, I mean, the, the sort of premise of the sublime is the loss of the human figure within the landscape. Mm. And I think that that happens in both, both ways, you know, so in, in these, a lot of the close-up shots, there's a small shadow or sometimes not at all or a sound that proposes that the, the figure is present, but you, the figure isn't emphasized. And then in the long shots, the figure is present, but the sound doesn't locate them. And, that was a strategy towards like make letting letting the physical world be have as much presence as the, mm. the like the human. It does also seem though that there's like an inventory that's being taken as well of, of the space in some mm. ways. It made me think of kind of origin of the species or maybe even Terry incognito. Like there's like almost a little more of a know, traditional documentary quality of documenting objects mm. or things. I'll take it. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's true, like, you know, because those things are records of a sort, yeah. like the magazines, they're, they're, you know, they're traces. There's something that I'm really interested in, uh, of like, like clues, mm -hmm. putting in clues to, to the past, you know, the, the past of a, of a place. And, and, you know, we talk about the, the presence in a space, you know, we're, we're, this is really important. That kind of like where these things were shot, 
Mm. You know, so the fact that the the black metal section is is shot in a in a Norwegian club. Mm. I mean, but it's not a Norwegian you, band, right? Like, it's not a Norwegian yeah. band, but like we had to take them there. We yeah. had to take them to like the birth of black metal, and you know that 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 place has a resonance that we really believe in. We we couldn't have shot that in in Britain or America, you know, I don't think. Because and it had, it had a, I mean, I think importantly it had a real kind of tension for mm. the band to be playing there because their, the claims that they were making as individuals were sort of put on stage in front of this group of mm. black metal enthusiasts. Well, also just having a black member, I mean, like, like you have Burzum and like there's a conversation surrounding black metal that's not always so permissive of yeah, difference. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the singer for the singer in the band is, is Hunter Hunt Hendricks mm. from Liturgy, who yes. um, routinely receives death threats. Which is <laughs> like a funny, I mean, what else? They can't, black metal fans can't really, they can't kindly critique things, right? <laughs> it would be out of keeping. I mean, they have to be like, send knives in the mail or some shit. <laughs> Skulls, pinkies, ears. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I was thinking about the, you know, the resonance of spaces. So yeah. The same thing applies to Northern Finland and these, these places which were once had communities and work um, and a social space and life uh, that didn't work out and they've left. You know, this, is, this was a, a kind of utopian idea almost. And, um, well, at least it's... Uh, uh, a hopeful idea that this that this place could uh, provide families with with a living, um, and yeah, it didn't work out. So these are these are the kind of traces, the place, the the houses which Rob kind of squats and magazines from ten years ago, um, calendars from twenty years ago, eighty three or something. Um, so you know that they even. You don't need to explain something in order for a space to have that kind of resonance. Yeah, I mean, we always hope that. I think we both come from, we both operate within a conceptual art, contemporary art space where there's other material that surrounds the film, or you, you sort of have to, if there isn't that material, you sort of expect that your viewers are astute and attentive. And so, um, you know, the first image, that, uh, image of people that you see that's not Rob that you see in the second section has Finnish. I mean, they're magazines that have Finnish and I, th I think Finnish language. And mm -hmm. I think it proposes that there's, there's been a different, that he's in a place that's not yeah. the Pacific Northwest or <coughs> Victoria, or, you know, something like that. Um, and I, I mean, the, the idea, within that, there's also something we're talking about the representations of yeah. nature. You know, there's that wallpaper and the wallpaper of flowers, which is offset by the actual lichens and other things in a film, which is also representing these things. So there's a kind of complicated set of questions about, or the sunset and the sunset, um, these things that are how they're how they're seen, how they're experienced, how they're transmitted, and because it was because we're also looking at paintings, landscape paintings at some point, talking about them from when the <laughs> romantic period is it. I guess we were looking at 19th century romantic paintings. Like of the sublime? Or yeah. Because yeah. we talked about the sublime quite a lot. I mean, that's what we were interested in for that section in particular, was this kind of, that relationship between the human and the landscape and, and you know, wanting to kind of think about that, the idea of the terrifying, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the unnerving, which is why we ended up in northern Finland and not in Norway, where, where we were originally going to film it all, um, because Norway was, in a way, too pretty and mm. too familiar. Um, Finland has a much kind of darker, more ominous kind of presence to it, and probably because it's, you can't really see a horizon a lot of the time. You're just like miles and miles and miles of forest, occasionally a lake. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, and and that you know within like looking at I think the question about this thing in the present, which is what we talked about a little earlier, um, about where the sublime exists now. I mean, there's we also were thinking about Thoreau, but but more so 
a kind of contemporary twist on Thoreau, which is Ted Kaczynski, the mm, Unabomber. Yeah. And I think, I mean, uh, James Benning's newest film, Stumble Pass, actually does something around that as well. But there's, you know, he's, he's a guy who, a mathematician who left the world and went to live in a hut mm. and started to become really aggressive towards other humans when other humans started to encroach into the natural environment. And mm. there's something about, I mean, I also saw this Kelly Reichardt film, Night Moves, um, the other day, which is, you know, like this idea that once you're, if you, <laughs> it's really easy to get sort of stuck in your own uh, mental space mm. when you're just alone in, in, these, in these places and that something sort of darker can, can come out of it, not necessarily, but it was maybe a, a more interesting uh, confusion or, or like interruption of what Thoreau was doing was to think more about the kind of potentially negative outcomes, which I think ties directly into black metal mm-hmm. because the you know black metal album covers always have an illegible script and like some trees, mm-hmm. which is about it's about nature as like this this dark as this force which is not dark in the sense of of evil, but dark. Carpathian forests? So like, yeah. yeah, just something that's, that's a bit more, less easy to immediately yeah. take on. It's not, it's, not like, it's not like walking in the Grand Canyon or, you know, it's like walking in a place where you could get lost mm-hmm. and then you would die. You would like freeze to death or, or just, you know, or you'd find a really great blueberry patch. <laughs> I love to think about black metal musicians picking blueberries. <laughs> Which they do, certainly. That's why they look so messy around the mouth. How does this all relate to when the shack gets burned? <laughs> Dude, because they we have a... Like we're, we're also trying to get death threats or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just it? kidding. <laughs> yeah, very clean mouths. But you burned out a shack, so we were talking about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that was one of the first images that we were also thinking about as, I mean, it's one, it's, it's one of the most striking uh, mythic images of, around the idea of black metal is like church, church burning. Yeah. And it seemed important to have, to set a house on fire in relation to that. I think the reasons for it actually became much clearer. I mean, it was, it was an idea that we had and it was, a, it seemed maybe like a stupid idea or, or just an idea, but then as, as we got in, started making the film it became something it wasn't that, stupid it was just a joke we didn't yeah. we didn't take it seriously it was like yeah it'd be great if we could burn a, a house down but it became something that began to make a lot more sense mm-hmm. and made more sense i think particularly in relation to ideas around civilization and society and structure and you know like embracing these things or rejecting these things it's just sort of trying to complicate the relationship that this character has to the social world mm. um, which is in a way, the world that, and also is his recognition, of, uh, his recognition of, of things being transient. That yeah. he's he's somebody that's on the move. Right. I guess that he's not sticking to one thing. Mm. Yeah, he's not he's not burning down a house that he built. Mm. Right. He's not he's not he's not burning down a new house or any of these things. He's I mean, well, we can possibly maybe he just came across a burning house. It's not, <laughs> it's not really clear, but yeah. Um, was it Al Liberty that has the house burning? I was trying to remember. I feel like there's a, the one of your burning? films. There's something. There's a structure. Yeah, no, I had a huge, huge fire in Al Liberty. Yeah. yeah. And there's, you can, I, I kind of framed it so that there's a barn in the background that looks That's like it's it on fire. Yeah. But this time it actually, you are actually it's, burning. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Yeah. It was really one of the, the most exciting things I think either of us have ever filmed. Because mm. it's so big and loud and, and beautiful. You can just stare at it for hours we did what about the community in the last section when you talk we've been talking about black metal and we've been talking about community but what about I mean you have the community of black metal fans but you also have this kind of small community of the band that you've you've made for this particular uh, film and it's one that as we've kind of touched on is is a is different like it it, it has members that don't necessarily fit into the broader community in certain ways Um, it it kind of seems more inoperative like in that that I think is Nancy's term about like when you put a bunch of things that are different together, they're a community, even yeah. if they're if even if they don't think they are, mm-hmm. like there's something happening. I, I mean, I would disagree with the. I mean, I would actually say that they are 
uh, all of the all of the people in those bands are black metal musicians. Right? Yeah, yeah. And black metal bands, and it's they may not play within in like corpse paint. That's it. Uh, yeah. In Norway, yeah. but yeah. they do. They do. They are like super accomplished musicians mm -hmm. who are deeply invested in this particular style and other styles of music. But it's something that they're um, involved in. And so, yeah, it was it was a similar gambit towards what happens in the commune, the sort of construction of bringing different people together in spaces that are existent with similar kind of backgrounds and ideologies. Um, but I think what happens in the black metal section, which I, I don't know if we realized until we were, I mean, we, we, we had an idea that sometimes people speak and they clarify what, what your idea is. And there was, I think we were talking to Nick McMaster about playing black metal and he said you know when we're in this like we're all just we're not playing for the audience and we're not playing for the other members of the band we're just playing for ourselves mm -hmm. and we're that's why we're good because we don't want like we we're not trying to catch up with each other we're not trying to like we're just doing this thing we're like in this thing and there was a really to, to me that seemed like a really profound statement of the the individual within the social structure, and and that you see that not just in the band, but you see it in the audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, black metal is is typified by what is it like, the 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 speed of the the, the bass rhythm, mm -hmm. the the drum beat is is such that it's like too fast to headbang to, mm -hmm. and it's too we'll slow see, to blast, like blast beat. Blast so, yeah, and it's kind of drones, right? Yeah, like, yeah the guitars yeah. like it's it's more of like a. A movie. I mean, there are other genres of metal that that where people like freak out and move around a lot. But black metal tends to be like a pretty has a, a fairly stoic mm. reception, you know. Um, and that was, I think, again points towards the the position of the individual within the group, which is also not so dissimilar from the individual within the cinema mm. that you're you're in a social. You're in this space, and you're all experiencing the same thing, but you're experiencing it on your own. Mm. Does that explain kind of the the transcendental kind of reaction of the crowd? Where it seems like it's like there's a disjunct where it, it's maybe footage from the concert, but the audio has concluded and it's been inserted afterwards. Like they're continuing to. Uh, yeah, yeah, slowed it down. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, you and you. you oh, that was with that. that with no, the, that we shot that that Whitney Houston memorial show, right? That's from an entirely different concert. Yeah. But it seemed. It, it, <laughs> was there like an audio dis? Like, was it? Was that actually? It, it was not to what was happening on the soundtrack. Like when the. I mean, the, that that drone did happen on the night, just maybe not at that moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean it goes. It becomes. Yeah, it, it becomes like yeah, non diegetic yeah. and um, yeah. We yeah we filmed that part because um, that's we, we turned the strobe light on and yeah the, that part of the audience it's, yeah it's 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 slow motion so mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the sound would have gone slower and but it was also about it just it's, gonna, it's a oh, dude. oh god what's going on shit this is live what are you gonna do take it oh yeah I forgot I forgot pee? we're not editing were you gonna go in the bathroom no I wasn't. I was going to go and ch uh, check the time because I want to go and see this Simon Lang film. Mm. It's 2.10. 2.10. Okay, we got a bit Five longer. Five more minutes. Parting thoughts. Five more minutes. Yeah, what are your parting thoughts? What are they? <laughs> I, I like the ending. I mean, I was thinking about in both of your films when sometimes like the audio is no longer in sync perfectly with what's happening. And it, to me, it, it does feel a little transcendental. It seems like the, the performance has ended, there's a drone that's kind of concluding things, but like the song itself is, it, is for, for all intents and purposes finished, but the audience is still kind of uh -huh. in this mode. I, I mean, it, it has that temporal quality we've been talking about, about the present, like, sure. because it seems like the present has like been cut and switched over into two different presents right. that are happening at the same time. And maybe, I mean, Ben's films have uh, uh, like trips and, and rights and like how, what, what does, what do you expect or, or hypothesize as like the viewer's experience at the end of this film, like or what are you aiming for? Where? Huh. I mean, it's it's often really hard to like think too much about 
what exactly you want your audience to do mm. or feel. Or uh, but the, ideally, I, or just optimistically, or dark optimistically. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I kind of hope that everyone has a really different experience because they're all different mm. people watching it. But I think we always talk to, you know, we always think about cinema as something that can be um, experiential um, and um, yeah, I think with, with with this film, we're we're interested in like the transformative possibilities of cinema, and yeah, I think it's a it's a kind of um, yeah, it's not so much of a of a cognitive response, I guess, that we're after a kind of intellectual response. Well, it's but certainly not a prescriptive response. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that neither of us really... May, may, I mean, I, I believe in the, the, cumu the accumulated effect of cinema, but I don't believe in cinema as... I'm not particularly excited about making films that, that use cinema as a call to action. Mm -hmm. And obviously, obviously, right. But there's something about the production of environment, the production of experience that will somehow resonate into beyond the film. Mm. That there's there's something about these spaces that we've constructed and provided that that will serve as like further in the inquiry into into how all this stuff operates. But I mean, experience is, is first and foremost, and I think the conversation with cinema is really critical. Like what cinema can do and how it does it, but also then what what that does to the bodies that experience and, and how and what those things we carry from them. I, I mean, this is a film that doesn't have an answer, which I think is maybe one of the difficulties of it because it wouldn't be really facetious of us to provide one. To but, provide one, yeah. Like, but uh, I mean, it'd, be Im it'd be impossible anyway. Yeah. I mean, I certainly don't feel like I have any kind of answers. Um, but that, I think that's why we've made the film we yeah. have, you know, because. I guess we're also looking. Um, yeah, so it's more about questions and possibilities than solutions, I think. Or, right. I mean, they're possible solutions, temporary ones. Yeah, and making, I mean, what do I hope you, what was the question? What do we hope they'll take away from it or do with it? I don't know. No, I was just Which thinking, like, I was thinking just broadly, like the trans like transformative or experiential yeah. or like, you know. What, what thoughts you have towards the spectator at the end of this particular film? Well, I think the film is really generous, yeah. and that's something that is, is always sad when there's a perception of it being Difficult. ungenerous mm. or like locked in or something, because it's actually, I think we're, I mean, we're asking a lot of our viewers, but I think we're also like giving a lot mm. to our viewers in terms of this, these, these sets of possibilities or possible experiences that do have like, resonance in, in the outside world or with one's everyday existence and um, while we're not proposing that one goes and goes to a black metal show or, or joins a black metal band or like joins a commune or whatever I mean that like the introduction of these things as as, as critical acts that are that are also like really critical perceptual acts mm, yeah. is, is pretty important. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. The seventh part. What is the seventh part? Cheese making. Cheese making. Artisanal.